Hello, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. Tonight, we have the second of our two episodes on Egypt, and we are going to be floating up the Nile to explore Alexandria and Luxor. My name is Gabe Gunning, and I have the privilege of joining you all as your moderator tonight as we travel with Rick. Now, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our tour guide for this evening, Rick Steves. Rick, over to you. Thank you very much, Gabe. And uh, it's so nice to have everybody gathered together today. You know, this is this is kind of like becoming routine Monday night. What do we do? I'm going to travel. I'm going to invite all my travel buddies like you, and we're going to get together. So this is our Monday night travel. And it's right here. Uh, I feel like you're in my living room. I'm in your living room. You got your favorite travel partner with you. We got our munchies and our drinks. Uh, so uh, we're going to go to Egypt here in a moment. Uh, uh, last people, last week, people were asking, uh, is this my living room or my kitchen or whatever? And I thought I would just invite you into my house for a moment. Uh, this is the middle part. Over there is my living room and getting all set for Christmas. And over there is my kitchen. And I've been learning how to cook during this COVID time. And this is my office right here. And this is where I've, I just go to work every morning. And I'm really thankful that I've got um, work that I can do from home. And I'm able to live comfortably here in Seattle while we wait out this pandemic. And we have a lot to be thankful for, I think, and a lot to be hopeful for right now as we start a new beginning with, with leadership that embraces science and with uh, vaccines on the way. It is just a matter of patience. And we all want to travel. But right now, I think Monday night travel is uh, a great way to, to help get through this time together. You know, when it comes to Egypt, I went to Egypt first back when I was a kid. I was like, it was 1975. I think I was 20 years old or something. And I was with all the backpackers in, in Athens and it was a mystery. People were with all sorts of scare stories about Egypt. You know, they said, there's no maps there. And the, uh, the, the, the uh, hustlers are really aggressive. And it's so hot that the tires are melting to the streets. And I've got my nerve up and I flew to Egypt. And of course it was nothing like that. It was just a wonderful place to travel. I've always enjoyed going to Egypt. I went back there in um, 19, about 20 years ago, about 1999 or so. And we made a TV show on Egypt. It's the first time I ever made a TV show with Simon Griffith, who is my producer ever since he's been my right-hand man on the road to make the TV shows. And in 2015, I went back to Egypt and uh, working with Tarek, who you're going to meet in this show, and scouted and wrote scripts for a one-hour special on Egypt. And then things got too dicey in Egypt with politically, and it was not very stable. And I thought it's not a right time to make a travel show about Egypt. And then last year, I just decided now it's a good time. And I just went over there. And a, a year ago, almost today, we were flying home from Cairo with all the footage for a wonderful one hour special. The one hour special aired all over the United States. For our Monday night travels, we've been airing the two individual episodes. We, we turned it into two half hour episodes. Last week, we saw Cairo. And this week, we're going to cruise the Nile from Alexandria all the way up the river past Aswan to Abu Simbel. So it's so fun to be able to share this with you. I do want to remind you, if you want to watch the show without me pausing, I'm going to be pausing all the way through it. You can watch it streaming anytime without the interruptions, and you can watch the whole one hour. There's material in the one hour show that we weren't able to fit in the half hour shows, and that is at ricksteves.com. So you can watch it anywhere. But right now, we're going to have some fun getting behind the scenes. And I'm having my dinner. And um, actually, this is double header, so I'm having the second course of my dinner. But let me introduce to you a little bit what I'm doing because this is becoming a tradition as I go on the travel on Monday night. What are we eating? What are we going to drink? And uh, we like to have some food that is culturally appropriate. In Egypt, they have mezes, little dishes of, of this and that. And then you dip your pita bread in it. Pita comes from an Egyptian word that's something like the staff of life or something like this. And pita is that pocket bread. And it's just great for dipping. When I went to my Middle Eastern deli, um, I, uh, he was selling uh, pita chips. And I tried them alone, and I didn't like it. But with the dip, with the baba ganoush and with the hummus, it is great. So there's a lot of different dips. I've got the baba ganoush. And baba ganoush is um, it's sort of the classic Egyptian dish: roasted smoked eggplant garlic, lemon juice, parsley, cumin oil, and tahina. Tahina is a sesame paste. And then the hummus with um, olives is um, basically mashed chickpeas or garbanzo beans with garlic and smoked paprika. So this is just delightful. I've been dipping into it all evening already. Um, tzatziki 
is another great uh, dish that you'll find all over the Eastern Mediterranean. And this is basically yogurt with cucumbers, garlic, and mint, and sometimes a little bit of fresh dill on there. And that's good for dipping. If you've been to Greece, you know about the stuffed uh, grapevines or the grape leaves. And uh, that's all over the Eastern Mediterranean. It's filled with rice and different spices and herbs. And something you're bound to have when you're in Egypt is um, tabbouleh salad. And this is bulgur, parsley, mint, onion, tomato, olive oil, lemon juice, and garlic. And it is just a delightful, oh, I'm not supposed to eat on camera. I'm gonna wait until we're going. Okay. And then um, as far as drinks go, you know, most Egyptians are devout Muslims. Observant Muslims do not drink alcohol. So tea would be the thing you might wanna drink. So I've got my tea because I wanna be respectful to the local culture. I want to be like a cultural chameleon. I want to go like a temporary local. Now, when you're in a country that has these kind of um, modesty requirements or conservative requirements and so on, in people's homes, things are different. Al almost anything goes behind your front door. And that's what I found it anyways when I'm in Islam. And uh, a beer, some, some people will enjoy that, some won't. But uh, you've got your beer if you want to. But the national drink would be tea. Okay, now with that in mind, I hope that you don't mind me munching while we travel and I hope you've got something to munch on too. And I'd like to take you to the Nile River and we're gonna start with a tease that is in a falooka. And you know, a tease is a chance to grab people's attention. And this was one of my favorite teases. Let's go to Egypt. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, sailing beyond Europe this time. We're on the Nile exploring the historic and cultural wonders of Egypt. Thanks for joining us. Egypt is essentially a big desert with a lush green. Well, first of all, I got to pause right there. If you're making a TV show and you've got this kind of light and you've got this kind of control, I'm on the bow of a ship going up the Nile and it's this warm magic hour light. I've got some texture in the foreground. I love those, that heavy rope, my hand on the, on the cleat. And then you've got this dramatic scenery floating behind you. You got complete control. Nobody's getting in your way. You're totally legal on the boat. Let's just make some on cameras. So there we go. We're opening the show on the Nile and then we get into a montage. And in the montage, I had to acknowledge that we're not doing Cairo and we're not doing the Great Pyramids at Giza because if anybody tunes into this half hour show, they're gonna wonder where is Cairo? Well, that's in a different show. So then we're gonna be off and running in Egypt. The Nile River Valley running right through its middle. This is the Nile and the vast majority of Egyptians live along its banks. In this program, we'll sail much of it and visit many of its greatest sites. Saving Cairo and its magnificent pyramids for another episode, we'll visit cities and sites all along the Nile. Exploring the fabled city of Alexandria, we'll venture into a local market and enjoy a shisha. In Luxor, we'll revel in the glory of the pharaohs, their temples, and their hidden tombs. We'll hoist the sail for an unforgettable felucca ride. Then we'll upgrade to a riverboat and kick back while enjoying iconic Nile views and a glimpse of timeless rural lifestyles. Our finale, the magnificent ruins of Abu Simbel. In the southeast corner of the Mediterranean, Egypt is one of Africa's largest countries. The Nile River flows from south to north. We start in Alexandria, fly to Luxor, cruise up the Nile to Aswan, and finish in Abu Simbel. We're starting in the north on the Mediterranean coast in Egypt's second city. Alexandria is one of the great cities of the Mediterranean. It was Egypt's capital for almost a thousand years until the Muslims came in the seventh century. Not as big as Cairo, it faces the Mediterranean, has milder weather, and feels a bit more European. Alexandria is a thriving port town with a busy harbor. 
fishermen, as they have since ancient times, harvest the sea to help feed the city while taking advantage of this safe haven. The harborfront corniche is lined with cafes, restaurants, and people out enjoying the scene. Strolling here in the cooler hours of the early evening, you appreciate the inviting ambiance. So I just got to say, in this show, we had the luxury of beautiful light, long shadows, warm tones, the sun going down. Every magic hour we were out filming. That's when the colors pop, the people are out. My cameraman calls it chasing the light. If the light is good, we are out filming, that's for sure. One thing we have to do in this in the show, and thankfully I've been able to scout it in advance. I'd find a great cafe, which just has a wonderful buzz, and then we'd come by and we'd talk to the owner of the cafe and he'd say, sure, you can shoot it. And then I'd wander through the cafe and try to find a couple that looks like they'd be inviting and let me sit down and be instant friends with them. The camera shoots, it looks like I'm having a nice um, cup of tea with them, and but I'm only there for five minutes. But the people throughout we're so gracious. We're going to go to a little cafe here and you're going to see some friends I met. And uh, they were just bit players in a TV show from some guy from America. And that was the end of it. This beachside cafe has a relaxed vibe, not unlike other Mediterranean towns I've enjoyed. Alexandria can feel spirited, young and progressive. In fact, this city helped spearhead Egypt's Arab Spring Revolution back in 2011. The populace is an intriguing blend of conservative, modern, religious, and hipster. The city has a chaotic energy exceeding anything I've experienced in Europe. With the constant beeping of passing traffic, its center is a carnival of commercial life. Scenes like this are why many come to Egypt and why many don't. Why many come to Egypt and why many don't. I wanted to be really careful. I'm enthusiastic about Egypt, but it's pretty intense. And I didn't want to get uh, some of my viewers to be overly confident. So it's got a rough edge, uh, but I wanted to show it. Um, it's uh, a country that if you're a TV crew, you got to be careful. We had to have a police escort everywhere we went. And as a matter of fact, when I think of this scene right here, I remember we we had a, we were following a policeman through town and a policeman behind us, and the siren was going. I, I remember once thinking, "Oh, there's a siren. What's going? Oh, that's our our police escort." And then we're stuck in a traffic jam, and the siren's going, and we just thought, "This is absurd." It's like the siren is saying, hey, everybody, there's important people in this van and they're stuck in traffic. Uh, it's, it's free pickings. Uh, but we uh, we managed just uh, to really appreciate our security team. We had a man with a machine gun under his coat the whole time that just kept his distance, made sure we didn't get in any trouble and also made sure we didn't shoot stuff, I suppose, that they didn't want to be shot. But it worked out really well. And we're glad that we um, were able to enjoy Egypt, bring it home and uh, do it safely. This urban commotion literally sits upon lots of history. But apart from this ancient Roman theater, which dates from the fourth century, very little survives. It's mostly destroyed in the sea or buried under today's city. So we try not to do too many on cameras because it's better to look at all the interesting action, but sometimes you can't cover something. I mean, we're going to be talking about stuff on this on camera. You just couldn't cover. So somebody's got to say it. The host has to say it. Also, in order to understand your sightseeing, you got to have the historic context. So this is typically in the beginning of a show, we have a, an opportunity to compress a lot of important history into one carefully, finely crafted on-camera message. It's kind of heavy history, but it lets you understand the, the game plan here, the broader context. And then our sightseeing makes more sense. So here you got a chance to have that on camera. And then right after the on camera, you got to remember the two most important things in Alexandria are long gone the great library and the great lighthouse. Nothing left of them. So we had to use an artist's um, imagination of them, a historic sort of etching to show what it might have looked like. Alexandria was named by Alexander the Great, who founded it in 331 BC. It became one of the great cities of antiquity with a population of several hundred thousand. 
Queen Cleopatra ruled Egypt from here when the city rivaled Rome as a cultural and intellectual capital of the Mediterranean world. And it's here that St. Mark introduced Christianity to Egypt, establishing what to this day is the Coptic or Egyptian church. Ancient Alexandria was home to two of antiquity's greatest sites, neither of which survive. A huge library and an awe-inspiring lighthouse, one of the wonders of the ancient world, built in around 300 BC. Imagine the lighthouse that stood at the mouth of this harbor. It was so tall that light from its fire could be seen from 30 miles out at sea. After guiding ships from across the Mediterranean safely into port for 15 centuries, in about the year 1300, an earthquake hit and it tumbled into the sea. Today, a 500-year-old fortress marks the spot. In fact, it's said that many of the stones from the lighthouse were dredged out of the sea to help build it. While the ancient lighthouse guided friendly ships in to Alexandria, Centuries later, this fort was designed to keep enemies, like the Ottoman Turks, out. And Alexandria was famously home to perhaps the greatest library in the ancient world. No ship was allowed to dock here without giving up its books to be copied. Tragically, about 2,000 years ago, that amazing repository of knowledge was burned and destroyed. Today, its legacy survives in the city's modern library, Built in the year 2001, walls are inscribed with characters of the world's languages through the ages. An inviting gathering point for Alexandrians, the library feels promising, perhaps offering a chance to see the next generation of this country's leaders. The interior is welcoming and airy, with space for hundreds of readers to sit in its main reading room. For me, no visit to Alexandria is complete without venturing into its ramshackle market district. While you can buy just about anything in these thriving and exotic streets, there's also a strong sense of community that naturally comes with such population density. And to better enjoy this convivial scene, I'm joined by my Egyptian friend Tarek in a classic shisha joint. As I've done in Turkey and elsewhere in the Middle East, I occasionally enjoy this traditional and very social form of smoking. Nice, huh? This is a beautiful scene. It's easy to relax here. So relaxing, comfortable, peace. A lot of people in the United States, they say this would be a, a, a hookah or a hubbly-bubbly. What is this in Egypt? Shisha, it's called shisha. shisha. Yeah. yeah, and few people now call it hookah, hubbly-bubbly, argila. Let's just vent out, be casual, socializing, you know, talking with friends. We do, we do it with close friends. We vent out and talk yeah. uh, and have fun. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, I'm doing my best to look at ease with a big hookah, but it is a cool experience to be sitting in a shop like that. I mean, look at that. That is very nice ambiance. And you sit there with your friend and you suck on the hookah and you get to know the, the wait staff. Uh, and this for me was a luxury. I love shooting after dark in a market. And in Egypt, there's a lot going on after dark because the sun's down and it's more comfortable. Everybody's out. There's that great sort of vibrancy. And uh, one of my real fun, creative challenges with the crew is to have an evening to shoot in the market. And rather than shoot along as we go, we keep our camera down and we walk through the whole market and we figure out exactly what stops we want to shoot. And then I have a huddle with Simon and we make sure that that'll all weave together nicely for the bit we're looking for. And then... We go back and bam, 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 bam. We shoot each one of those bits. So here we had three hours to work. We spent the first hour scouting and the last two hours shooting. And when that was all done, we were ready to have dinner. And you'll see the dinner in a moment. But I don't think there's any crew in the game that could do what my crew did here in Alexandria to get this amazing market in a Alexandria shot in just a couple of hours. Notice also how we can just sit down at the card table or the backgammon table or the dominoes table or whatever and make friends and be comfortable with the people that we just met on the fly. The Tarek could spend the rest of the evening right here. We've got some exploring to do. A short walk is filled with cultural serendipity and we'll start with dessert. It's hard to walk by this place without enjoying at least a taste. And delicious. That looks great. What are these? This is Sawada Zainab. Zainab's fingers. Zainab's fingers. Mm. Thank you, Shokran. Mm. 
The key to this kind of sightseeing? Have a curious spirit, have fun, and explore. These guys are way too fast for me. The entire neighborhood is an endlessly fascinating market, and it's open late. There's fresh bread. Why chicken? Very fresh poultry. Olives straight from the desert. And something I noticed everywhere, friendly and inviting people. I know about six words of Arabic, but it did stop the smiles. Okay, we've worked up an appetite, and Tarek knows a great place for fish. Vilhena Bosepa. What is the fish? What am I eating here? This is Denise from the Mediterranean. Okay. That's yeah. Denise from the Mediterranean. And here we have a restaurant that I scouted it five years ago, and it was just thriving. And then we got here on this night, and it's just, it's a very popular sort of a standard restaurant. Everybody loves it. But there was almost nobody there. There was a couple of people, and they didn't want to be filmed, so we couldn't shoot them. But in Egypt, it just seems like we always had an entourage. There was somebody from the tourist board, and their uncle, and there was somebody from the government, and there was the driver, and, and our security guy. And so we could just sit them as we wanted to. And then we had to decide, OK, who's going to sit next to me, and who's going to have a little sound up? And uh, sometimes it's impolite, but we have to choose the person that will be best on camera, who's able to um, you know, uh, share about the culture. And, and then we have to turn off the music, and we have to turn off the fan, and, and uh, we have to work with the wait staff. And it's, it's hard to relax when we're shooting a meal. But I just love to share all of this beautiful cuisine. And it's so fun to be able to eat the same food here in Seattle while we're eating it in Egypt. So. I don't know how you say bon appetit, but enjoy this meal. Then this is fried calamari from the Mediterranean too, and fried prawns. We dip our bread in this, and that. What is this one? That's tahini. That's babagani. This is tahini. Tahini, yes. Like a combo. Of course, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So fried eggplant, tahini, you find this in many countries in the Mediterranean. Absolutely. And each country we claim it's ours. So today we claim this is Egyptian. This is Egyptian from the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean region shares many delicious and similar dishes. What country wouldn't want to claim this as their national cuisine? But tonight, it's definitely Egyptian. While Alexandria sits at the delta where the Nile flows into the Mediterranean, we're heading south to Luxor, about 500 miles upstream. Luxor, straddling the Nile, was for many centuries the capital of ancient Egypt. Beautiful light. End of the day, long shadows, not so hot. It is 100 degrees there. We were there in November. I mean, it's hot. Imagine in the summer. Maybe tires do stick to the road. If you ever see, a horse carriage clip-clopping through the shot. It's not accidental. I would imagine for this shot, we had a good take in the can and we decided let's try to do another one uh, with a horse carriage going through. So here's a horse carriage. Let's roll it, get it, see what happens. It's famed for its tombs and temples, which were mostly built between 1500 and 1000 BC. These were the glory days of the pharaohs. From their palaces here, they proudly ruled a united kingdom, Upper and Lower Egypt together. Luxor is a standard stop on the tourist's itinerary. While a city of about half a million people today, Luxor feels like a tourist town, with its riverfront hotels, shops, and ancient temples gathered along the Nile. The riverbank is lined with characteristic boats, ready to ferry sightseers to a world of ancient sites. Popping into its busy market, you find a colorful bazaar that serves both locals and tourists. The friendly welcome is a reminder of how important tourism is for Egypt's economy. The souvenir I take home? Memories of so many vivid snapshots of humanity. Luxor's charming riverfront promenade welcomes strollers enjoying the cool of the early evening. As the sun sets, we appreciate the timeless beauty of both Luxor and the Nile.
the Luxor Temple is particularly dramatic at twilight. Standing in the middle of the city, it's evocatively floodlit and welcomes visitors in the evening. The towering front wall proclaims the power and greatness of the pharaohs. This grand entry was marked with a pair of soaring obelisks. Both still stand, this one here and its sister in faraway Paris. This holy complex was built around 1300 BC, nearly a thousand years before ancient Greece's golden age. Egypt's temples were not places of public worship, but sites of sacred mysteries, where priests and pharaohs huddled privately with the gods. Reliefs show pharaohs wooing the gods with rituals and offerings. While the temple may have been dedicated to the gods, it seems all the statues celebrate the great pharaoh, Ramses II. Egypt's ultimate king, Ramses ruled for 66 years and did a lot of building. The sheer size of the complex with its forest of massive columns leading to huge squares is a testimony to Ramses' power to get things done. Evening's a great time to visit. Under the stars, people wander, learning and dreaming, hmm. wonderstruck at the achievements of ancient Egypt. Luxor's other great site, another magnificent temple complex, is best enjoyed early in the morning, beating the heat and crowds. An avenue of battered sphinxes leads to the awe-inspiring main entrance, heralding the temples of Karnak. Karnak was the most important place of worship in all Egypt. Back when Luxor was Egypt's capital, this sprawling complex of temples was dedicated to the grandiose holy family, a trinity of gods, Amun, Mut, and Khonsu. It was built over many centuries throughout this New Kingdom period when most of the great and famous kings ruled. The Great Court is the largest single area of the complex. It was used once a year for an elaborate festival feast celebrating fertility fertility of the land, the people, and the kingdom. As you venture farther into the complex, things get older and crescendo in religious importance. Everything at Karnak leads to a small chamber that marks the very heart of the temple complex, the Holy of Holies. This was the most sacred spot in all of Egypt. On this pedestal sat a statue of the top god, Amun-Ra. Amun-Ra was the god of Luxor, the god of empire, Egypt's god of gods. The Nile still flows as it did for the pharaohs, the lifeblood of civilization then as today. Luxor's riverfront is busy with boats, big and small. The traditional felucca, long a hardworking cargo boat, now hauls vacationing tourists. Anywhere on the Nile, I love a felucca ride. That is one glorious moment. I mean, I've got rosy memories of every trip to Egypt, and part of that is always a felucca ride. You know, we had so much history and archaeology and ancient temples, we needed a break from that. So now is the time to work in the felucca. And, you know, you can book the boat, although when you book a boat, usually they try to get you these over-the-top big ones that are kind of kitschy, and I wanted just a simple, humble, small felucca, so we had to struggle to get that. Uh, but you can book the boat, you can uh, count on a nice sunset, but you can't book the wind. And we did it in Luxor, we had everything in place, but there was no wind, and it was a, I was so disappointed. We scrambled and we got what would have been okay. But then we decided we could do a felucca also in Aswan later on in the trip and just weave it together here, and we did. So we're taking a little bit of liberty with where exactly are we in the itinerary, but we got glorious felucca experience. And um, it's just a beautiful, beautiful experience to have. Uh, imagine if you're the TV producer and you're in another boat taking shots of me on this felucca and driving around, and then I'm giving an on-camera to the cameraman that's in the other boat, and then the cameraman will get back on the felucca with me and shoot it. It's a wonderful process. And what we got was an opportunity to enjoy the fluke and at the same time, enjoy the beautiful slice of life, beautiful, intimate views of life along the Nile. 
the hand-stitched canvas sail artfully catches the breeze. Egyptian boatmen have been sailing this river for thousands of years. Today, they expertly maneuver as tourists leave every care behind, enjoying this scene, essentially unchanged since the time of the pharaohs. Here, where the desert meets the Nile, the lush ribbon of green is a reminder of how fundamental this river is to all life in Egypt. As the sun sets, palms become silhouettes, ensuring memories created are never forgotten. Wow. Well, I want to take just a moment here and answer a few questions that people asked last week, because we've got, well, we've got nearly 3,000 households tuning in and can't get to all the questions. By the way, you've got the Q&A widget there. You're welcome to answer quest ask questions, and we'll get to those as best we can in a little while. But there's a, this is a two-part thing on Egypt, and I thought I'd answer some of these Egyptian questions because they were good, and they are from people that might be wanting to travel to Egypt. So I'll just go through them really quickly. Is Egypt safe? Is a regular tourist safe there? I think Egypt is safe if you travel in a smart way. And I thought it's worth staying in a nice hotel, a Western hotel with good security. And I spent the money to have a local guide taking me around. You know, you don't see a lot of individual travelers. It can be done, but even the backpackers seem to be taking tours. And I would recommend either hiring a guide, it's quite affordable, or taking an organized bus tour uh, to see the sites we saw. And everything we did on this tour, if you had a local guide, you could do yourself. Uh, did anyone get crew, uh, sick on the crew? No, we were thankful we were, uh, stayed healthy. We ate carefully. Um, are Coptic believers persecuted? 10% of Egypt is Coptic Christian, and uh, nearly 90% are practicing are, are Muslims. Um, and uh, the Coptic and the Muslim communities pride themselves in living together as they have for 1,500, 1400 years. Um, but there are fundamentalist Muslims that are terrorists, just like there are fundamentalist Christians and fundamentalist Hindus and fundamentalist uh, Jews that are um, uh, just going to be um, violent for their their agenda. And the fundamentalist Muslims have attacked the Coptic Christians in Egypt. That's why there are a lot, there's a lot of security around the churches in Egypt. Were you ever able to shoot without the traffic jams? No, there's traffic jams everywhere. A uh, hundred million people in Egypt, and most of them are packed into cities in Alexandria and Cairo. We had terrible traffic jams. What percent of women cover their hair? Well, there's different, um, you can't just enter that overall, because it depends on what strata of women in the society. Uh, tourist women, uh, modern, secular Egyptian women, uh, traditional conservative women, urban women, small town women, and so on. You can imagine there are more conservative slices of Egyptian society where all the women are covered. Some of the women are completely covered, others just cover their hair. Modern women would not be covered. Uh, when you're out and about as a tourist, you'll find a mix. I would say tourist women should just use what they feel comfortable with. But if you dress in a in a enticing way in Egypt, I think it's actually dangerous. You shouldn't do that. You should dress conservatively uh, given the tensions in their society. Are women, uh, tourist women expected to wear a scarf? Not expected, but I think it's smart to have a scarf and wear it when you feel like it's a good idea. Um, what's the basis for your need for security? Um, well, terrorists have targeted tourism. Tourism it used to be the number one source of revenue in Egypt. Now I think it's um, tolls for the Suez Canal or something, but, but tourism potentially is a huge deal. And the terrorists know if they want to ruin Egypt's economy, all they got to do is uh, get a tourist. And uh, so there's huge security around the tourist industry in Egypt. And it's something I'm thankful for when I'm there. Does the security interfere with your fun? Never. I just had a lot of fun in spite of the low key uh, security. Uh, last week I mentioned we had to pay off, pay off the police with uh, bribes and so on. And how much did we have to pay? Somebody asked. I don't know. Um, our guides did, took care of that for us. Um, as individual tourists, you don't need to worry about that. It's a TV crew that has to bribe their way in and out of places. Um, are you expanding your tour program beyond Europe to include Egypt? No, we just do Europe. Um, and whenever I do a TV show featuring other countries, Iran, Palestine, Israel, Egypt, 
what I do in our landing page on our website is list the guides that I've worked with and the outfits that I know that are honest and reliable and good guides. Of course, in Egypt, I'm working with Tarek and his company, Egypt and Beyond, is worth Googling and learning about if you're going to go to Egypt and looking for a guide or a tour. How common is English in Egypt? I found it to be very common. I didn't have much of a language barrier at all. Uh, of course, if you're venturing out into the villages, you're not going to find a lot of people speaking English. But in tourism, in hotels, in transportation, in cities where you've got educated people, English is widely spread. Do I need to have a medical passport for future travels? You know, I just have my medical passport. I, I, I've never heard it called that, but it's what I call it is the yellow international certificate of vaccination. And this is my new one. I had to get it uh, just a year ago because I was going to Ethiopia and Guatemala and it had to show what shots I've got. But when I was a kid traveling around Europe, everybody had yellow international certificates of vaccination to prove that you've had your shots before they lay into that country. I would imagine in the future, when we get out of COVID, we're going to have a vaccination certificate and it will say if we're vaccinated or not. And if I was running tourism in a particular country, I would not want to let in anybody from another country that couldn't prove that they had had their vaccination. Uh, let's see. Is haggling rude? No. Um, in the right spot, it's expected. You don't haggle at a train station and you don't, uh, you know, buying your ticket. You don't haggle in a restaurant. You don't haggle um, in a department store. But anything you buy in the street, you would haggle for. Anything that doesn't have a price, anything that you suspect has two standards, local and tourist, you haggle. And the merchants triple the price and then you cut it in half and think it's good and you're already paying 50% too much. So just um, know when it's appropriate to bargain. Why is there so little change in 2000 years? On the last show, I said there's almost no change for 2000 years in Egyptian history from 3000 BC to 1000 BC, like 2000 years of Eisenhower. Why? Because the Egyptian kings convinced their people that they were gods. And if your president or your king can con you into thinking that he or she is a god on earth, you vote for him again. You obey the laws. You want pro status quo. You want no change. So for 3000 years, with God's ruling Egypt, there was no change, almost no change. Also, it was related to the superstition about, oh, the Nile is flooding. Every year, magically, the Nile floods. It irrigates or it, it, uh, it fertilizes the land with that sediment and the crops grow. The gods must be happy. You don't mess around with things when the gods are happy. Just do it again. Okay, thanks for your questions. And again, you can ask more questions in the Q&A and we'll get to those. Um, and I want to remind you once more that the first half of this show we did a week ago, and you can watch it in our archive at ricksteves.com, or you can watch it at Rick Steves on Facebook. And today's show, what you're watching right now, will be uh, saved and uh, available for everybody uh, tomorrow, uh, 24 hours from now, on my Rick Steves Facebook page. Hey, before we get back into the show, I would like to share with you just a few slides from a PowerPoint because we had so much fun filming there. You fly directly from JFK to Cairo. And when you're on the flight, you have the opportunity to always know where Mecca is. If you're Muslim, you wanna pray and you wanna pray in the direction of Mecca. So that would be on the back of the seat in a Muslim country carrier. 20 million people in Cairo and they live this way. That's dense population. I wanted to film that and we filmed a little bit of it. Um, and uh, boy, it's that's where you put 20 million people. This is Tarek. He runs Egypt and beyond. Just a, a beautiful guy, a wonderful tour guide. And he's got a great crew of guides. This is one of our guides. And I spent a few days with Tarek and Marwa ahead of time. And we had a very long list of things we had to see. I had to scout it so I could get every all my ducks in a row to make this TV show. In this shoot, we had two cameramen. We always have Simon, my producer, and he does everything, carries the tripod, holds the light and so on. But he knows what we're doing. He makes sure it's good TV. Carl is uh, our lead cameraman. And then Sean joined us, Sean White from, uh, uh, from Vancouver Island. And then there's Tarek, our local guide. So that's our crew. When we're in Egypt, we pile into the minibus and we'd get it done. After a long day of shooting, we'd go back to our hotel through very good security. When you got a crew, when you want to stay healthy, when you got lots of fancy camera gear, you want to have a Western class hotel. So we had all that security that any big shot diplomat would have and so on. For me, it's very poignant because I'm tuned into the gap between rich and poor and the privileged and the struggling. And, you know, half of humanity is trying to live on $5 a day. And here you're spending as much for a hotel as you'd spend in New York. 
Uh, and it's over the top. I mean, your jacuzzi comes with all these jets and a TV screen and the, and the toilet is so fancy it comes with an owner's manual. I just thought it's absurd, but it's this nouveau riche approach to being an elite in a, in a, in a developing world country. Um, the, the security was just really over the top. And every time we tried to get into a place, here's the back door of the Egyptian museum in Cairo. You know, you're stuck for an hour while they sort through all the papers and you got this wrong, you got to go get that. And it was pretty frustrating. Um, this was the gateway to a big shopping mall. We wanted to shoot in there, but no, big discussion. Can't go in with the cameras. Here, we're talking to the security guy in the mosque. Can you have Westerners with a camera in here? Well, yeah, but you got to be cool and so on. So it was just a lot of time sitting around waiting for us to get permission to go in to do our work. Sometimes we would able, be able to do things a little more low key with our smaller cameras, but ideally you want to use your big cameras. Uh, the big news in tourism in Egypt is the new museum, the massive pharaonic in scale museum of Egyptian art that's going to be out at Giza where the big pyramids are in the suburbs of Cairo. Look at this thing, lots of security to get in. It wasn't even open yet. And this will be open when you go back to Egypt. And this is a huge museum with all the antiquities right there next to the great pyramids. If you're making a TV show in Egypt, like anywhere in the developing world, you've got all of this corruption, all of these big shots that want to wine and dine with you. And they just think all you want to do is get a nice dinner. And we spent a lot of time schmoozing. We had to schmooze. And it's the last thing I want to do when I'm working, just get out of my way. I want to make a TV show. But I had to be sensitive and didn't want to be rude and so on. So spent a, a little more time than what I would have liked uh, being networked and schmoozing. Um, security, not always that um, inspiring, but you got your security guard there. This was our security man for part of our tour. You'll notice when you go to Muslim countries, a lot of devout Muslims have a, a callus on their forehead. And that's a callus you get from praying a lot. You go to the mosque and you put your head on the carpet. And I've noticed that people that, you know, it's almost a sign of your devotion. Uh, a lot of people wear that as a matter of pride that they spend a lot of time praying with their head pushed up against the carpet. This is our crew, two cameramen and Simon, and our police escort. This makes me happy. We're totally legal. The guard is standing back. We're free to have our light wherever we need it. The cameraman can go over the fence and get in close. And I'm just sitting in the back going, yes, this is going to be beautiful to actually be there in King Tut's tomb to bring it home. A manger. There's a manger scene. I was uh, just uh, struck when I saw that in Alexandria. You know, I've never really seen a manger, but that's what a manger is, just like we think of when we think of Bethlehem. Look at this. This is a disturbing image. This is the new barrier on the beautiful, formerly people-friendly promenade on the port, on the coast, where the beaches are, where the people stroll, in anticipation of the rising sea. All over the Mediterranean, resorts are going to be putting up bigger walls to keep the sea out as the sea rises and we keep dragging our feet when it comes to dealing smartly with climate change. Simon and I spent a lot of time working. Every night we'd work on the script, make sure we know what we're going to do the next day. Ah, I'm enjoying my meal tonight, especially because I can watch and remember what we ate and all the fun we had with the people of Egypt. All right, so that's just a little insight into what we enjoyed while we were making this show. And now let's go back and travel up the Nile. Across the Nile from Luxor are hills rich with some of Egypt's most important ancient sites. While most sightseers cross the river on a fleet of touristy shuttles, we're riding on the public ferry with the locals. One of my real joys, by the way, is having an experience that I had when I was a kid. I mean, this is back in the 70s. And I remember in the 70s, all the tourists were spending two bucks to go on the tourist ferry. And the local people were spending five cents, a nickel, to go across the river on the workers' ferry. And to this day, you can take the kitschy tourist ferries for 10 bucks each, or you can take the local ferry with the local people and feel a lot better in your travels. So I wanted to work that into the script, and we did. I even got an on-camera on the short ride across. And we're heading for the Valley of the Kings and the ancient tombs. To the ancient Egyptians, it seemed logical to live on the east bank where the sun rises and bury your dead on the west bank where the sun dies each evening. The valley is blanketed with yet to be excavated ruins. Here, two lonely statues herald a long gone temple. And here, 
burrowed into an arid mountain range is the Valley of the Kings, where mummified pharaohs hide out with their treasures, awaiting the Eternity Express. This valley was all about protecting royal tombs, and so were the Great Pyramids before it. It was to ensure that all those valuables made it safely into the afterlife. Ironically, rather than protecting tombs, the pyramids were actually attracting thieves. Again and again, pyramids were looted, and pharaohs were waking up in heaven with absolutely nothing. By about 1500 BC, pharaohs stopped building pyramids and began hiding their tombs instead. These tombs, buried deep in the folds of this valley, proved to be more secure than the intentionally high-profile pyramids. While around 60 tombs have been excavated in the Valley of the Kings, far more have yet to be discovered. The tomb of Ramses IV was typical. It had a long ramp, intricately carved and painted, leading to the burial chamber. This massive granite sarcophagus was slid down the ramp. It protected the mummy of the pharaoh. Slathered in hieroglyphs, prayers, and symbolism, it was all designed to boost the pharaoh into the next life. Jackals stand guard. And here, a god presents two onks, the symbol of life. The burial chamber walls are remarkably vivid for their age, sealed away dry, dark, and forgotten for over 3,000 years, they're beautifully preserved. Tourists can still clearly see ancient Egypt's elaborate spiritual world. The most famous tomb in the valley is of King Tutankhamun, AKA King Tut. Another long passage leads deep into a chamber where you find more well-preserved paintings surrounding an empty stone sarcophagus. It was one of eight nesting boxes and coffins that protected the pharaoh's body. Remarkably, Tut's actual mummy lies nearby. The ancient process of mummification ensured that the body was there for the soul to inhabit in the afterlife. And you gotta admit, Tut doesn't look a day over 3,500. While his reign was of no importance historically and only lasted a few years, Tutankhamun is the one pharaoh whose name we all know. That's because in 1922, this tomb was discovered with its treasures intact. And those treasures are now back in Cairo. Tut's mummy was in this extravagant coffin. He was wearing a dazzling mask, 24 pounds of gold, inlaid with lapis lazuli, and filled with symbolism proclaiming the greatness of this boy pharaoh. A short venture beyond the famous sites takes us into a timeless Egypt, untouched by tourism. The vast majority of Egypt's 100 million people live along the banks of the Nile, and most of them lead traditional lives on land made fertile by the river. So I can tell you what I'm doing when this shot was taken. I'm very likely sleeping, getting my beauty rest. My crew is so passionate about getting the good shots and they love this sort of slice of life stuff in the countryside, that they'll be up when it's still dark to get situated. And then when the sun rises, they're out there shooting in the fields with the farm community. And uh, I'm up late at night working on my scripts and that sort of thing. And I'm just really careful to make sure I stay healthy during these shoots. So, and they don't want me in the way anyways, cause they've got to art. They, this is the artful stuff. This is not just covering the script. This is the artful beauty shots. Um, and uh, to be able to shoot all these gorgeous shots of people at work and the, just, the, just the intimate culture of Egypt along the Nile as it has been for thousands of years. And then to cut that in for the rest of the show, as you'll see with the river uh, cruise that we took, just glorious. I'm so thankful for the passion my crew has for the beautiful culture that we get to see in all these shows. And I got to say, I'm thankful for public broadcasting 
to give us a platform where we can air this. I'm thankful that we have a, a populace that appreciates the value of public broadcasting. That's a struggle. And if people like you understand the value of public broadcasting, that inspire us to all be more engaged and, and more open to the world and to celebrate the diversity and the richness of this planet. And then I'm just so thankful to be able to bring it home and share with you the wonders of a place like Egypt. Plowing with oxen, sowing seeds by hand, and harvesting their crops. They farm as they have through the millennia. In some ways, life along the Nile seems to have changed little since the days of the pharaohs. The major difference, the annual flooding, once essential to nourish the soil with silt, has been controlled by an enormous dam. Today, fertilizing and irrigating the soil is the work of engineers rather than the gods. With the Nile now tamed, farming in Egypt is possible throughout the year. Luxor is a busy port for river cruise boats. Fleets of these provide multi-day Nile cruises, which have become a standard part of an Egyptian tour. We're riding farther upstream for a look at the most scenic stretch of the Nile. The trip upriver takes you by natural beauty and seemingly ancient scenes, interrupted only by modern cruise boats. Here you can see, it's like a caravan. And these cruise boats leave Luxor on the same day. And then I gotta say, it's a little bit um, exhausting and, and smoggy in the beautiful, um, pristine river countryside because you're in a long caravan of these boats. I don't know why they do it, but you gotta schedule that. The boats from Luxor to Aswan, it's one of the critical things that people do for the classic Egyptian itinerary. They leave once a week, every Monday. So we had to be leaving Luxor on Monday and the boat functioned as our hotel, I think for four, three or four nights. It gave us plenty of time to get on cameras and beautiful shots of the countryside and so on, a little bit of free time also. And I was scouting it a few years earlier and I was just blown away by this phenom where they are attacked by salespeople in little runabout boats. So I don't know when it was gonna happen, but I told my crew, we're gonna have dinghies that are gonna tie up on the boat and then they're gonna sell stuff like a bunch of invading pirates wanting to sell us trinkets. And uh, when you look at this, imagine the cameraman having to be thinking on his feet as all of this is unfolding, getting all the bits so that it can be cut together to be the beautiful little sequence you're gonna see of the salespeople attacking our boat on the Nile. Long stretches pass by timeless slices of Egyptian life as vacationers have little option but to relax and live at the pace of the steady boat heading against the current of the fabled river. It's so peaceful until the tranquility is broken by pirates. Nope, they're eager and enterprising salesmen who artfully tie up to the surging river boats to display, model, and haggle, selling their souvenirs the hard way. Whether you buy anything or not, you can enjoy their entertaining show afternoons on both the port and starboard sides. As the sun gets low in the sky, we enter the magic hour. Scenes crescendo in beauty as they glide gracefully by either side of the boat. We pass patient fishermen, grazing cattle, Farmers at work, children play, villagers do their chores, and minarets call all to prayer as the sun sets. After two lazy days, we reach the city of Aswan, the last major port on the river. An ancient garrison town famed for its granite quarries, today it's embraced tourism, taking full advantage of its attractive riverfront. These days, Aswan is most famous for its massive dam. It was built with Soviet technology and money back in the Cold War. 
a game changer for Egypt. It tamed the Nile, providing electricity and controlling the flow of the once erratic river. The dam created a huge reservoir called Lake Nasser. Its creation submerged many towns and ancient treasures, but the most important temple was saved. To visit that temple, tourists catch a short flight from Aswan. It's an easy half-day side trip over one of the largest man-made lakes in the world. The Temple of Abu Simbel, while originally built by Ramses II in about 1250 BC. This was a thrill for me. It's one of the great sites I have yet to see in the Mediterranean world. And um, I hadn't had a chance to scout it. And we only had the amount of time allotted to the tourist groups that go down because you fly early in the morning from Aswan, you land there, they give you two or three hours, and then you get back on the bus, go to the airport and get back on the plane and fly back to Aswan. So we flew down there, and uh, we hadn't scouted it yet. We just dashed out of the bus. We got there before everybody else. We quickly um, uh, scouted everything. We had a huddle to see what we're going to do. We made a shot list. And then we got the critical stuff, you know, the on cameras and so on. And then we shot out the clock. You just you get the critical stuff and then you get all the beauty stuff until you're out of time. You could always use more time, but you do what you can with the time you've got. And then we got back on the bus, got back on the plane. And that night we flew to Cairo. And we had one more day in Cairo just to get a little bit of fine, final touches on the shows, and then we flew home. So we're just wrapping up a great 16 days in Egypt, and we came home with that footage one year ago this week for a one-hour special and the two episodes you've seen here on Monday Night Travel. But right now, we're going to go to the southernmost point of our trip in Egypt, the amazing site of Abu Simbel. Was relocated here only about 50 years ago. Abu Simbel was saved from being submerged in the lake and lost forever after an international outcry. Thanks to a heroic effort in 1968, this ancient temple was cut into huge blocks and relocated to this spot, high and dry, for at least another 3,000 years. Four towering statues of the powerful pharaoh stand sentinel at the entry. Ramsey's wife and some of his children, considered less important and therefore smaller in scale, are at his feet. Inside, the central hall is lined with more imposing statues of Ramses. They're surrounded by reliefs showing off his power. Here, the Pharaoh leads his army into battle, riding his chariot thoroughly destroying his enemies. And finally, in the sacred sanctuary, Ramses assumes his place in the company of the gods. Admiring this one last magnificent temple, you can't help but ponder the rich and complicated 5,000-year story of this civilization. I hope you've enjoyed our look at Alexandria, Luxor, and some of the wonders of the Nile. I'm Rick Steves. Until next time, keep on traveling. After guiding ships from across the Mediterranean safely into port for 15 centuries, the pyramids were actually attracting thieves again and again. Well, I hope you enjoyed that look at Egypt. I certainly did. And I want to remind you that every Monday we gather like this. If you want to see the other half of Egypt, that was last week, you can watch the saved version of this Monday night special uh, on our Facebook page or on our website, or you can go to the TV section on our website and watch the whole one hour special without all the pauses. But I want to thank you for joining us and remind you, we got time for some Q&A. So I'm going to send it back to Gabe. Hey, Gabe. Hello, Rick. Thank you so much for that wonderful float up the Nile. Um, before we get to some questions and answers, I was wondering if you could give us our note from our sponsor. 
Thank you very much, Gabe, <laughs> because our sponsor is Rick Steves Europe, and we are managing to get through this pandemic with no revenue. We've got a uh, hundred wonderful people like you on our staff, and we're going to be standing and have it together by the time we get done with this pandemic. And today, as a matter of fact, is quite an exciting day. We've got uh, new leadership that's embracing science. We've got a, a, a vaccine that is full of promise, and we fully expect to be traveling again by the end of 2021 with our tour groups. So um, that's the main way we make our money. That's how we do. Uh, that's that's last year we took what 30,000 people on 1,200 different tours. This year we produced this wonderful full color 64 page brochure for 2020 tours. We were three quarters sold out. We had more than 20,000 people gave us deposits by the time that COVID hit. And then we ended up having to give everybody back their deposits and say, hey, we'll still be here when we come out of this pandemic. We have the 2021 version of this catalog for our tours available not in print like this, but as a PDF at ricksteves.com. You can download it and that's your opportunity to sort through all those travel dreams and see which itinerary tickles your fancy. But I'm just very proud of the work that we do. We have our guide standing by. We still have our team together here in uh, north of Seattle and Edmonds, and we're ready to help you travel through Europe when we can travel again. I want to remind you that this is the season for our Christmas uh, sale on our website. Everything is between 20 and 50% off. And the two books I've been holding up a lot are these two books because I'm just thrilled with these books. These are the books we've written in just uh, before COVID hit, really. Uh, Europe's 100 Greatest Masterpieces. That's my dream come true, is to collect my favorite pieces of art and collect them here. 100 masterpieces, each beautifully described uh, with the help of my co-author, Gene Openshaw, brilliant tour guide and historian. This is a coffee table book that if you love art, you'll really enjoy. And if you don't love art, you will after you read that. It's a sweep through the story of Europe from the Pantheon to Picasso. The other book that I'm really hot on during this uh, pandemic time when we can't travel for a little while is a collection of travel dreams called For the Love of Europe. And I wrote this, uh, and it's an ideal book for reading when you can't travel. It's 400 pages of all my favorite writing that I've done over my lifetime of traveling and reporting on it. None of the practical tips that's in the guidebooks. This is just for the love of Europe. My favorite places, people, and stories. Again, that's yours, and everything's on sale on our website if you have a gift that you need to get for a traveling loved one. I do want to remind you that next Monday, we're going to have a special edition of Monday Night Travel, and it's featuring our European Christmas special. And it's a visit to seven different countries celebrating uh, the way tr uh, traditional and sacred and non-commercial way that Christmas is celebrated all across Europe. And I'm going to, uh, this show has been sort of a standard thing on public television now for a decade. I'm going to have my finger on the pause button and to be able to give a little insight into how we produced that show and the fun we had celebrating Christmas all across Europe. I do want to remind you, during this time of holiday and love and, and celebrating the meaning of Christmas and all that, it's a time to remember that there is a lot of people that will never see their name on a plane ticket. There's a lot of people that wish they had a trip to cancel and there's a lot of struggling people. And we are doing our annual fundraiser for Bread for the World. Uh, and um, we've uh, every year we raise a million dollars for Bread for the World. It's an advocacy organization that reminds our government that food aid is not just nice. It is smart. It's an investment in a just and stable world. And what I do each Christmas is I challenge my travelers to, I will match $500,000. So together we can raise a million dollars to empower Bread for the World with its work in Washington, D.C. I want to get some mileage out of my philanthropic buck and there's no better way to do it, I think, than through advocacy. That's lobbying for hungry people. And there's a lot of important work that needs to be done right now as we're putting together these aid packages to get out of this uh, pandemic and so on. And we're gonna do great stuff. So I just wanted to give you an update on that. 4,300 of our travelers, people just like those of you watching right now have donated a total of $554,000. That has exceeded my match. I'm kicking in $500,000. So together we've raised over a million bucks for Bread for the World. And there's still a couple more weeks to go on this fundraiser. Learn more about it on the front page of our website at ricksteves.com. So that's a word from our sponsor and from our heart during this Christmas season. And now let's answer some questions, Gabe. All right, Rick. Um, one of our most common questions, um, 
is um, especially coming from people like Teresa. Um, she was wondering what is the best time of year to visit? And also, even when it's hot, does it get fairly cold at night? You know, I think in the summer, it would be brutal. I, I, nobody goes in the summer. It's just too hot. Uh, I, the whole Mediterranean area is pretty hot these days, and it's just brutal in Egypt. So I found it very comfortable in November. We were, we were filming in November and in, in early December, and it was beautiful. I mean, the, during the day, uh, it, was, it was in the 80s, I suppose, but it's a dry heat. Uh, but I'd like to, for me, the, the winter is the best time to go. And in terms of budgeting for Egypt, um, how does it compare maybe to some European countries? You know, it's this way in Cuba, it's this way in Egypt, it's this way in India. If you want to go and, and live like a local person, it's dirt cheap. But most of us don't want to go and live like a local person. We want air conditioning. We want safe food. We want to get in a taxi that can get us there in one, you know, without messing around. And when you want that level of comfort and efficiency, you're going to pay European prices. So, um, you know, I would say when you go to Egypt, expect it to be about as expensive as Germany and you're gonna be staying in German class hotels. I was, I was staying in German owned hotels. Um, I, I have, with that budget of what I'd spend in Germany or England, I can afford a private guide meeting me at the hotel at breakfast every day and taking me around for the day. So you're helping a local person, you're spending what you'd spend in Germany and you're going to a great country. Now, if you're a backpacker and you're ready to just go in there and live off the land, you could live on $20 a day if you wanted to. But uh, I would say if you've got the money to spend, it's better to have a refuge and the efficiency and the safety of, of going in the privileged traveler class. I don't normally say that, but I say that in a country like Egypt. Um, you mentioned safe food and we had a couple people asking, do you need to worry at all about drinking the water or um, what food you're consuming if it's produce that hasn't been cooked? Yeah, it's the same old um, common sense standards you would have when traveling in the developing world. You don't drink the tap water. You have um, well-cooked food. Don't eat food that's been sitting around for a long time. Uh, it's better to have cooked vegetables and peeled fruit and so on. So you want to, you know, if you're going to rest, tourist class restaurants, frankly, I'm more interested in staying healthy than in having um, these wonderful uh local, honest experiences in a place like Egypt. So I'm going to eat really nicely, but I'm going to eat in a restaurant that caters to diplomats and tourists and so on, or you have dinner back at your hotel. Um, so Rick, you showed you and Tarek um, having a, a nice casual smoke. And um, Monica was wondering, um, do women also smoke in Egypt? There are different takes on the woman's place in society. Tarek's wife probably would not go to that place and smoke. She's a devout practicing Muslim and she would cover her head when she goes out and she wouldn't be consuming alcohol or smoking. It's just not uh, in keeping with Muslim sort of sensibilities. Um, in Egypt, there are feminist type, highly educated women who as a matter of principle are gonna go out there and sit down in a, in a pub like that and own it. Uh, and I think that's exciting to see, just like there are women now who are insisting that they can drive in Saudi Arabia. But women are on a crusade. Um, and you've got traditional women, you've got country women, you've got women that are kept down by their husbands, you've got educated women and privileged women and tourist women, and all will have a different sort of standard. Um, but a tourist woman would be considered differently than a local conservative woman. A tourist woman would probably be in the same class as a well-educated, professional, urban, secular woman in Egypt. Um, moving on, Rick, to some kind of art and culture. Um, Vince and Brenda were noticing that, you know, there is some kind of cultural overlap between Egypt and, say, you know, um, Greece or parts of Italy. Um, what are some places in Europe that you see Egyptian influence or vice versa? You know, I don't see Egyptian influence other than I don't see Egyptian influence in Europe. I see Egyptian art that Europeans took during colonial times as rich countries can from poor countries. You know, you can see great Egyptian art without going to Egypt. You can see it in the Vatican. You can see it in Paris at the Louvre. You can see it, of course, at the British Museum, the amazing British Museum collection in London. All over, in Berlin, you've got Nefertiti. You've got wonderful Egyptian art in Berlin. 
uh, you can go anywhere, any cultural capital in Europe and find Egyptian art collections better than things you'll find in most great cities in the United States. Uh, but as far as cultural influence directly, you know, you could stretch it, but I don't think there's a lot. And is that a is that still a source of tension with the you know Egyptian art through other places? Is has Egypt formally requested the return of any of that artwork? I don't want to wade into that. I, I mean, <laughs> uh, my feeling is Egypt has so much great art. Uh, they've got they've got so much art they can't even show it all. You know, and I'm sure there are some chauvinists and some patriots that would say this is our art, give it back. And there's other people who would say we bought it. You know, we bought it not in a fair um, negotiating way, but we paid for it. It's ours. We've had it for a hundred years. Now get out of the way. Um, so a lot of times uh, a European archaeologist, archaeologists will go to a site in Egypt and they make a deal that they can dig there and they can take back so many pieces and then everything else they leave in Egypt. I believe that's how Nefertiti got to Berlin was uh, I forget the Ar uh, Schleiman or some great uh, archaeologist went down there and um, did all the excavating and he got to take back the best few things and the other stuff was was uh, kept in, in Egypt but it's a it's a controversy there's more of a controversy between Britain and Greece you hear a lot about that uh, but I don't hear a lot about it from Egypt but there's no doubt Egypt is the victim like any developing country of European colonial power um, and we'll finish with a couple questions about the the filming of the show. Um, some people were wondering, um, including um, Emmett, if you use drones to do any of your filming. I don't believe we had a drone on this show. Uh, we like to bring a drone when we can, but usually countries countries like Egypt or like um, Ethiopia. They, they're nervous about having a drone because of their security and they don't want little things flying around, you know. And when it comes to that, it's so cumbersome and so filled with backsheesh and legalism and contracts and we just don't mess with it. And the fact is you can buy good drone footage if you need to. So if you saw an aerial shot in this last show, uh, chances are we paid for it and we bought it from some stock house. Uh, but we do travel with our drone now in Europe and I'm so thankful for it because I was just in a little uh, favorite hotel in, on a river in uh, Austria and I wanted a wide shot of the town. It was Holland Tyrol. What are we going to do? In the old days, we'd get in our car and drive up to the hill to get a high wide looking down in the town. It would take us an hour for that one wide shot. All we did was stand on the balcony of our hotel, send the drone up 50 yards and we got a great shot. And then it bring the drone back home and you can just uh, have another glass of wine. So it's a huge um, luxury to have the drones. And uh, I'm so thankful to be working in this day and age because we've got all sorts of cameras that are so light sensitive. We've got the drones. We don't need to carry around a lot of cassettes with us. Uh, it's just a wonderful time to be making TV. And the last question that we are going to have time for tonight comes from Joanna. And she is wondering, um, it seems like you and the crew keep a, a pretty busy filming schedule, but um, are you able to ever make time to just enjoy things off camera in any of the destinations? If you asked my crew, they would say, it's never happened. I mean, <laughs> we work so hard. I. You know, I, I would expect them to work so hard, but I don't need to expect them to work so hard because they willingly work so hard. We are on a mission. We are working every waking hour to make the very best TV show and bring it home. We have an obligation to public television. We have an obligation to our public. We have an obligation to our mission, which is to inspire Americans to venture beyond Orlando, to use every little ounce of energy and time and light we have to make the best possible show. We generally spend six days, the three of us, to make a half hour show. And I cannot remember, a, there was one show, we did the south coast of Portugal once out of 150 shows where we actually had half a day just to kick back and enjoy the sun. But it just doesn't happen. I, I used to think I could get something done when I was dedicating all the time we dedicate to our TV production, but it's just all consuming. It takes focus and um, I love it. It's exhilarating. I remember, you know, in the movie when Patton said, I love war. Well, I love TV production and we bring home such great stuff and I'm so thankful for it. But if anybody told me, oh, we've, we, we've worked eight hours, you know, we need a, we, we can't work anymore today. You just wouldn't be on my crew. I mean, we are working when the sun is out 
we are working. And it's so fun for all of us to be able to bring it home because we're turning people on. We're, we're, we're sharing the wonders of this world. We're going to send a lot of good Americans to a lot of good little mom and pop businesses in Egypt. And that's just a delight. So, hey, I just want to thank everybody for tuning in. I want to remind you that we're enjoying this a lot. We hope you are too. It's Monday Night Travel. Uh, next Monday is uh, East. Is, it's Christmas time, and we're going to have a. It's a longer show. It's an hour show, so it'll be a ninety-minute experience instead of the, this about half an hour longer than today. And uh, we're going to have two showings: one at six, and then instead of seven thirty, one at four because it's a longer show. Uh, and then after that, the last Monday of the year, we've got a show called "Why We Travel," and this is a love story to travel. And I'm just. It's the most beautiful thing we have ever put together. It's a poem with the most lovely visuals that Europe has to offer. And uh, we're gonna do that. And then the first Monday of next year, we're going to Ethiopia together. And then after that, I don't know where we're gonna go, but we're gonna go somewhere exciting. So thank you very much for traveling with us and uh, happy travels, even if you're just staying home. Mm -hmm.